And we're here tonight to celebrate John Stuart Borden's latest achievement, the publication of his new book. There you see it up on the screen, but I actually have a copy here. Uh, American Glass, the collections at Yale. And this celebration of John and his book is uh, sponsored by the um, Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund. And as you can see on the screen, it will be followed by a book signing in the lobby and a reception. And John has his purple pens at the ready, so uh, buy his book and have him sign it. This book is really the latest in um, a series of collection catalogs uh, produced by the Department of American Decorative Arts um, that record the collections at Yale, whose core is the Mabel Brady Garvin Collection. And this collection was assembled um, by Francis P. Garvin, who began giving the collection to Yale in 1930 in honor of his wife. And these collections are among the great collections of American decorative arts in the country. Uh, in the 1950s, Mrs. Garvin redoubled her efforts to support the collections, and one of her charges to us was to publish the collections, and we did. Uh, Pewter was published in 65, the renowned silver collection in 1970, Clocks in 1973, the seating furniture in 1976, the case furniture in 1988, and the tables and looking glasses in 1992. After all these publications were completed, uh, there remained one strong collection worthy of its own uh, catalog, and that was glass. But in the era when online um, collection catalogs have become the norm, the traditional collection catalog, that is the published catalog, uh, in which every single factoid about every single object um, in the collection is really a thing of the past. And I think John really recognized that. And so he approached this book on the glass collection quite differently. While it really pays appropriate homage to um, Mr. Garvin and, his, and the collection that he assembled, it views the glass at Yale through a very wide lens. It looks beyond the art gallery to collections at the Peabody, the Beinecke Library, the Medical School, and the Yale buildings that have phenomenal stained glass windows. Uh, it is a creative approach for a new age, and I think if you open this book, you will really be surprised by some of the contents. John received his BA from Vassar College in 2000, his MA from the Bard Graduate Center for Studies in the Decorative Arts in uh, 2003, and his PhD from Boston University in 2013, where his dissertation a dissertation was Laurel Guild's Historical Modernism, Americana, and Industrial Design. I've had the pleasure to work with John uh, at the Art Gallery since 2006, and he is now the Benjamin Atmore Hewitt Associate Curator of American Decorative Arts. Tonight, focusing on Garvin's uh, collection of glass, he will detail the fascinating relationship between Mr. Garvin and his glass advisor, Rhea Mansfield-Niddle. Please join me in welcoming John Stuart Gordon. Good evening. I just want to start with a few thank yous. Anyone who has ever embarked on a large project with lots of people involved knows how quickly things go awry. This was not one of those projects. It was a dream team from the beginning, and I am so thankful to everyone who is involved in every aspect of making this book. I do feel like it was like half of the university. Um, and of all of that, I just want to call out a few specific thank yous. 
um, mostly to the repositories um, who opened their doors to me, to the directors, curators, collections managers who fielded my questions and then didn't mind when we had to borrow their objects to take photographs of them, to our incredible um, editorial staff here at the Art Gallery, specific, specifically Jennifer Liu and Tiffany Sprague, who polished my prose in ways I could never have foreseen and I'm infinitely grateful. Um, and to our colleagues at Yale Press, Mary Mayer, Kate Zanzuki, and Amy Canonico, who championed this project from the beginning. Um, Miko McGinty and Rebecca Silver, the um, designers, um, transformed all of this collective work into something really exceptional. And I'm so proud of the design they did. Um, the challenge was to make a book that you wanted to read and you wanted to look at. And they rose to the challenge. Most of all, I want to thank the photographers. This is a picture book with a few well-chosen words. But um, our in-house photographers, Tony Di Camillo and Richard House, rose to the challenge of photographing one of the most difficult materials to photograph. And it is their exceptional images that made me look at this collection new and really make this book something special. So, Although I'm being celebrated tonight and I'm literally in the spotlight, um, it is a communal effort and I'm so thankful. In June of 1930, the lawyer and businessman Francis P. Garvin presented Yale with his extensive holdings of American decorative arts, which he asked to be named after his wife, Mabel Brady Garvin. In the note he sent to the university, he explained that for, quote, 20 years I've been each day building this monument of love to my wife, and in the happiest moment of my life, I dedicate these collections to her. Those 20 years, from 1910 to 1930, were not only ones of love for the Garvins, but also of excitement for admirers of Americana, as new scholarship and pioneering exhibitions fueled the marketplace. Garvin began to amass his collection during these transformative years and was aided in his endeavors by a series of advisors, including the prominent glass expert Rhea Mansfield Niddle. Niddle's fiery enthusiasm and dogged research influenced the field as a whole and Garvin's activities in particular. The story of Garvin's glass collecting in many ways mirrors the story of American glass collecting during these seminal years. Many of the pivotal personalities and events make their appearance, and echoes of the era's predilections survive in its strengths and biases. Francis Patrick Garvin was born in East Hartford, Connecticut, to Mary Carol Garvin and Patrick Garvin, Irish Catholic immigrants who arrived in the United States in the 1840s and who established a successful paper manufacturing company in Hartford. In this portrait of the Yale track team, the young man with soulful eyes is Garvin. <laughs> he graduated from Yale College in 1897 and New York Law School in 1899. Through his networks of friends, including his roommate in Manhattan, Nicholas Brady, who is the son of a wealthy New York industrialist, he saw firsthand the benefits and obligations of privilege. He also saw its perils. After law school, he worked as an assistant district attorney in New York, where he prosecuted Harry Thaw for the murder of, Stanford, of the architect Stanford White in what papers salaciously called the trial of the century. <clears throat> Thaw was married to Evelyn Nesbitt, the chorus girl infamously labeled the girl on the red velvet swing. When allegations emerged that White had sexually assaulted Nesbitt years before, Thaw shot White in retaliation. The trial captured national attention, continually made headlines, and catapulted Garvin onto the national stage. In 1910, Garvin married Mabel Brady, the younger sister of his former roommate Nicholas. The Bradys were one of Albany's Gilded Age families. Mabel's father, Anthony and Brady, organized the Manhattan Oil Company became involved with the electrification of the New York rail system, and finished out his career as president of the New York Edison Company. He died unexpectedly in July 1913, leaving an estate valued at about $77 million. 
The scholar Catherine Whalen has drawn the comparison that the banker James Pierpont Morgan died only months before Brady and his estate was, eval was valued at about $78 million. So that gives you the amount, uh, range of, an idea of the range of money we're talking about here. In common parlance of today, they were the 1%. The six Brady children were bequeathed sizable portions of the estate. Mabel's share was administered by executors, and she was supplied quarterly payments. Notably, the couple began purchasing art and antiques before Brady's death, but their augmented income allowed this pastime to evolve into something more ambitious. The collection began as a young husband and wife buying furniture and glass with which to furnish their homes. They were curious, but not informed shoppers. As Catherine Whalen has described, one of Garvin's earliest advisors was the gallerist Arthur Vernet, who had storerooms in London and New York that sold English antiques. Vernet taught Garvin connoisseurship and guided him to think of his individual acquisitions as part of a larger whole. Yet the majority of what Garvin purchased from Vernet were items to be used, including sets of English and Irish stemware and cut glass decanters. After acquiring a few fake pieces of English furniture, Garvin decided to focus on American material. At this point, the collecting bug bit Francis. Although the collection ultimately bore his wife's name and her inheritance helped underwrite it, she exhibited only modest interest in its development. Garvin's early acquisitions were fairly conservative and proclaimed their ties to American history, including some purchases in 1918 that included pressed cup plates depicting the Bunker Hill Monument and a lidded mug engraved with the word Liberty. Early promoters of glass championed historical flasks and pressed cup plates as they often illustrated historical events um, or portrayed military or political heroes. What the glass depicted then was more important than where or how it was made. In the case of the lidded mug, it was supposedly an an early ex American expression of the revolutionary spirit, although it was more likely made in Germany for the export market. Garvin's flourishing patriotism was not just confined to his collecting, and in fact, his professional life may have influenced his, influenced his acquisitions. During World War I, Garvin worked in the office of the alien property custodian that took control of foreign-owned physical and intellectual property that were perceived as threats to national security. Although the office claimed that they were merely temporary stewards of the property, they covertly nationalized some of the more potentially lucrative material, specifically German chemical patents. Garvin quickly became the second in command of the alien property custodian and chief of its New York office. After the war, he headed up the American Chemical Foundation, a government-sponsored private entity that administered the nationalized patents. While these jobs have caused later scholars to be harshly critical of Garvin's politics, he saw his role as helping to defend American liberty and independence. It was during these years that his collecting became a second full-time job. As he later recalled, quote, during the war, I was working on average about 18 hours a day. The last half hour before I went to sleep, I gave to antiques reading auction catalogs, books, magazines, studying my own catalog, looking at the photographs of the collection we had assembled. That last half hour rested me as nothing else could. To assist his collecting efforts, Garden, Garvin's aide, Andrew Clark, and his daughter, Marion Clark, worked from Garvin's Madison Avenue office to manage a small network of dealers and scouts who combed the countryside in search of potential acquisitions. Garvin supplied some with expense accounts, while others sent in photographs, descriptions, or even thumbnail sketches like this one of the treasures they unearthed. To keep them accountable, Garvin insisted on written reports documenting their activities. He was equally rigorous with the objects themselves. As he told the writer Charles Messer Stowe in 1930, quote, I had eight years experience in the district attorney's office in New York, and I try every piece as I would a murderer. It must be proved innocent before I accept it. To help judge an object's innocence, 
Garvin sought out the advice of the leading experts of the day, such as R.T.H. Halsey, who had helped create the American Wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Eventually, Garvin found someone to advise him on glass. Rhea Mansfield Niddle was born in Ashland, Ohio. Her father was a probate court judge, and her mother nurtured a personal interest in ceramics. They divorced when Rhea was still young, and around 1898, her mother, Elma, married Henry Weil. The Wiles settled in New York and both subsequently became well-regarded antiques dealers. In 1906, Rhea married Earl Joel Niddle, who shared Rhea's passion for antiques and Ohio history. A profile that ran in the Cleveland Plain Dealer in 1936 described Rhea as, quote, a slight vivacious woman of staccato motions and keen brown eyes. On occasion, she likes gay figured clothes, and these seem to accentuate her vivid personality. Despite frequent and sometimes long interruptions due to poor health, this energetic person has persisted in her pursuit of ideas. One of these is that the old days of her state hold a story of which few people are aware. The story she seeks is about a kind of buried treasure, the treasure of art in a wilderness world. Niddle first met Garvin through her mother and stepfather. And by the spring of 1917, she had supplied him with Ohio-made ceramics and textiles. Over the next decade, she published articles on a range of topics, but it was her 1927 book, Early American Glass, that solidified her reputation as a leading glass scholar. Since 1900, a handful of books had appeared on various aspects of American glass, but Niddle's publication was the first to collate these disparate stories into a single narrative, to which she added her own meticulous research. She paged through old newspapers and historical records in order to establish a broader discussion of early glassmaking than had previously been done. Notably, her research expanded the field beyond the well-known names of John Frederick Amelung and William Henry Stiegel to, to encompass smaller ventures and additional rural centers of production. It would remain the key scholarly text in the field until the publication of George and Helen McKeeran's American Glass in 1941. Garvin apparently made note of Niddle's ascendancy in the field, as she called upon her when he finally needed the advice of an expert on glass. In early 1928, there were rumblings in the antiques world that Margaret Montague of Norristown, Pennsylvania was considering selling her collection of early American glass. Her passion was work attributed to William Henry Stiegel's American Flint Glass Manufactory, one of the first successful glass houses operating in the British colonies. The Montagues were on the verge of selling the lot when negotiations broke down. They approached the prominent dealer, Charles Woolsey Lyon, who in turn directed them to Garvin. Lyon offered to broker the deal and appraise the collection, but Garvin wanted an unbiased expert opinion. Thus, in July of 1929, Niddle was dispatched to Norristown to catalog the Montag Mon Mrs. Montague's nearly 300 pieces of glass. She delighted over treasures such as a three-legged pitcher emulating forms more commonly seen in ceramic or, or silver. She noted pieces that were compromised, but still worthy, such as this deep red salt or bonnet glass that she described as, quote, broken, but exceptional. Today, we privilege intact objects and original surfaces. But in the 1920s, as scholars and collectors were still coming to terms with the breadth of American antiques, fragments had value. A piece of wood exhibiting exceptional carving or a broken vessel in a difficult to achieve color were worthy of collecting as they helped make sense of this still emerging field. Collections also reflect the scholarship of their times. And that scholarship often evolves, sometimes in quite surprising ways. In the margin of her worksheet, next to this flip or tumbler, Niddle asked the question, rarest flip in America? And then she added the reply, very rare. <laughs> when the antiquarian J. Frederick William Hunter was researching St Stiegel's glass in the first decades of the 20th century, he noted references to enameled glass in 18th century Stiegel advertisements and assumed that must refer to objects like this brightly decorated tumbler. By the 1940s, the glass scholars Helen and George McKeeran began to question that attribution 
um, based on the fact of whether or not they used lead or non-lead glass. In the 1980s, Arlene Palmer observed that the period term enameled actually referred to latticino decoration, or twisted ropes of white glass, usually seen on stemware. So this type of painted enamel glass was likely not Stiegel, nor was it likely even made in America. In 2014, the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage here at Yale tested this piece using X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy which showed that the green enamel was made using chromium, which wasn't known to have been used as enamel or a glaze color until the early 19th century. Thus, what scholarship in the 1920s believed to be a rare dated example of early American glass has proven over the ensuing century to be a more enigmatic and problematic object, one that we still don't fully understand. With the acquisition of the Montague collection, Niddle and Garvin had a working relationship, and Niddle took it upon herself to ensure that that would continue. In September 1929, she brought 63 pieces of glass to Garvin's office on approval. The range of forms was intended to complement the Montague collection, and she left Garvin's assistant, Marion Clark, with specific instructions for how to present the material. Clark was impressed, writing to Garvin that, quote, I think everything fits in what you, with what you already have. Niddle also suggested articles for Clark and Garvin to read, clearly seeing her role as an educator, not just a purveyor of glass. Education was crucial, especially when what Niddle offered was not to Garvin's taste. Niddle's father-in-law, Henry Weil, had assembled an impressive group of 95 pieces of pressed glass attributed to the Boston Sandwich Glass Works. Their intricate patterns were a departure from the more restrained forms that dominated Garvin's holdings. And their appearance startled Clark, who wrote to Garvin that, quote, it was a surprise to everyone that sandwich could be so sparkling and brilliant. But no one would say that it is truly beautiful or delicate, nor a superb product such as Stiegel. What Niddle understood, however, was that pressing represented an important technological innovation and one in which America excelled. If Garvin was going to have a comprehensive range of American glass, this material must be included. He acquiesced and purchased the lot, although he never changed his opinion. In 1930, a reporter re revealed that, quote, personally, Mr. Garvin does not care for this sort of glass because it was not a product of hand craftsmanship. Garvin's opinion of pressed glass echoed larger discussions in the 1920s over the dehumanizing nature of machine production. These dovetailed with a larger colonial revival mindset where industrialization, increased immigration, and social instability gave many Americans cause to yearn for simpler times, even if those times never actually existed. Critics and collectors of early Americana privileged the handmade over the serially produced and equated simplicity with products of the pre-industrial age. Following that logic, the picture on the left with its hand-blown um, asymmetrical shape and swirling decoration was perceived as early American and good, while the compote on the right with its intricate designs and uranium-tinted hue was perceived as Victorian and bad. Although both objects were fabricated using s in similar settings and made around the exact same time. In November 1929, Niddle began laying the groundwork for what would have been her crowning achievement, acquiring George McKeeran's collection. McKeeran was in the, in the insurance business and had a passion for glass. Garvin allowed Niddle to initiate informal and anonymous discussions with McKeeran, and she reported the scope and stipulations of the deal. Quote, it is by far the largest collection in the world. It is by far the finest and rarest collection of American glass ever gotten together. It is the only collection of our native glass which includes practically every type, technique, and pattern used by our glassmakers. There is practically no pressed glass in the collection, although it is comprised of over 5,000 specimens. It is all blown and not mechanical production, and it contains many pieces which have never been found in duplicate. I presume you saw some of it on display at the Girl Scouts exhibition. Indeed, Garvin had. The Girl Scouts loan exhibition, 
now considered a landmark moment in the field of American decorative arts, was held at the American Art Association in New York in the fall of 1929. Garvin was a lender to the exhibition, and in this photograph of a portion of the installation, Windsor chairs owned by Garvin separate cases containing McCurin's glass. There were a few stipulations to the sale. McCurin wanted the group to stay together. He did not want to see it broken up and sold piecemeal. He also wanted his name to remain associated with it. The price was $400,000 and included every object he had purchased prior to November 22nd, 1929. Negotiations moved quickly. Garvin wanted Niddle to review the collection so he could provide a counter offer. Her appraisal of Mrs. Montague's glass took one day for 300 objects, and she estimated it would take about a month to cover McCurin's material. She wanted her husband there to help with the more physical aspects of the appraisal, and calculated that their transportation, hotels, expenses, and a stenographer would cost about $1,000. In addition, her fee for the appraisal would be about $1,000, as would her husband's. Garvin's response was swift and unequivocal. Your charge of $3,000 a month makes this whole deal with reference to the glass impossible. I cannot go these inflation rates. You are now asking more than the judges of the Supreme Court of the United States, and the traffic will not bear it. <laughs> the rebuke must have stung, for there was little correspondence that, that survives between the two of them through the following two months. In February 1930, Niddle tried to salvage the deal by lowering her costs, but still silence from Garvin. What Niddle could not have known was the precariousness of Garvin's finances. The Brady Trust had been reduced through mismanagement, over which Mabel and her sister unsuccessfully sued in the early 1920s. The couple's wealth was further depleted after the stock market crash in October 1929. Now, while they were far from indigent, Singular payments in the six-figure range were temporarily out of the question. Scuttling the McCurin deal over Niddle's ancillary expenses, however, evaded larger questions regarding Garvin's fiscal health. And this was a position probably many wealthy Americans found themselves in in those months following Black Friday. As it became clear to Niddle that Garvin would not reconsider, she wrote him a conciliatory and optimistic note invoking two other prominent collectors, George Lorimer, whose collection is now at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and Henry Francis DuPont, who created Winterthur. Quote, if you do not buy McCurin's glass, the interest on that amount of money will go a long way in collecting a fine collection of your own, as, which, as I said, can be done. George Lorimer and Henry DuPont are doing it. You can do it, too. McCurin never found a buyer for his glass, and in 1931, he began putting it up for auction. Breaking up the collection between numerous unknown buyers is expressly what he didn't want to happen. It's impossible to know if he bore a grudge against Garvin for pursuing and then abandoning the sale, but there are hints in the book that he published with his daughter in 1941. Objects from the Mabel Brady Garvin collection are illustrated but not credited. And, few, and the few occasions when Yale or, or Garvin are mentioned, it is often in unflattering terms. The McCurin's book became the authoritative text in the field, and so generations of scholars and collectors came of age unaware that there was any glass of consequence at Yale. Although he passed on McCurin's glass, Garvin still had big plans in the works. In the late 1920s, McCurin began to place portions of his collection at historic sites like Gracie Mansion in New York and at educational institutions like Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, the Gallery of Fine Arts, later the Yale University Art Gallery, and the Hammond Harwood House in Annapolis, which was then owned by St. John's College and was the venue for RTH Halsey's courses on early American material culture. Garvin was also planning a lending library of decorative arts, which was an innovative idea at the time, in which portions of the collection would be made available to historic sites and museums across the country. He envisioned retaining ownership of the collection and Yale serving as the administrator. But then the stock market crash intervened. As the scholar Catherine Whalen has uncovered, Garvin made a series of financial pledges to Yale during the 1920s. 
Following the crash, the university suddenly found itself with a potential budget shortfall and called in all its pledges. Short on cash himself, Garvin negotiated the outright gift of his collection in order to settle his debt. Thus, in June of 1930, the university announced the donation of approximately 5,000 objects to Yale. For most collectors, seeing their prized possessions enter a museum would mark the endpoint of sorts. But for Garvin, it marked just the beginning. In response to a congratulatory note on the donation, he wrote, quote, I feel just as if I've lost someone in the family and we're, and we're receiving letters of condolence. However, this wrenching feeling is only temporary, and I hope to devote the rest of my life to improving and perfecting the collections. Indeed, the rate of Garvin's acquisitions quickly increased. He sent Niddle traveling up and down the eastern seaboard to visit museums, collectors, and dealers, and send back news and frequently objects. She drew upon the inventory kept by her mother and stepfather in New York. In the Midwest, Niddle could rely on her husband. As she confided to Garvin, quote, Mr. Niddle covers the entire Ohio field and the adjacent territory, and when we get a definite outline of just what we want, there will be many sources to draw from. Rhea also drew upon the contacts she had established during the writing of Early American Glass. She tried to acquire some of the pieces she had illustrated for Garvin, and when she could not obtain the actual objects, she found similar examples. Niddle and Garvin also sought out objects with provenance, as family history was a useful in judging an object's guilt or innocence. The sugar bowl on the screen has an unusual white interior that evokes the color of sugar that it once contained. Niddle discovered it south of Pittsburgh in the possession of a family that claimed they had owned it for five generations. The inkwell is one of the only known versions of this form with a double opening. Um, which makes it very rare for some people, its history was also quite appealing to Garvin. It was acquired from Albert Hastings Pitkin, a descendant of the founders of the East Hartford Glassworks. By the 1920s, the name Pitkin had become a generic term for all greenish-brown glass with close-set ribs. But the family history of this example suggests that it may be more than just a Pitkin type, but actually might be the real thing. Niddle delighted in the hunt. In March of 1930, she excitedly wrote to Garvin, While in Chicago, I bought for you, on my own judgment, a broken, swirled, and fluted amber grandfather's flask, one of the rarest bottles in the country. I dare not risk the chance of letting it stay there another 24 hours. The next year, she discovered that a private collection of figural flasks was about to be dispersed. She pigeonholed the dealer handling the sale and convinced him to part with the most exceptional piece in the group a supposedly unique violin flask, decorated with, with General Zachary Taylor's motto, rough and ready, with rough on one side and, on ready, and ready on the other side. Then, in 1931, Garvin stopped collecting. He felt the depression had gutted the antiques market and that glass was no longer a good investment. He informed Niddle that he was going to, quote, delay all purchase all purchases indefinitely. And after mulling over the situation, Niddle tendered her resignation. Garvin refused to accept it and instead gave her a new assignment. As she later recounted to Charles Nagel Jr., Yale's curator of, of decorative arts, Garvin told her, quote, what I want you to do is go home and if you can do so from memory, write an article or treatise on my glass collection. Rip it up the back, shoot it full of holes, Give it hell. Point out all the deficiencies and gradually list the various items or groups of types which we haven't got. And then when this depression lets up, we'll start in to fill those gaps. And, will we, and we will end up by Yale having one of the tip top collections in the country. Niddle focused on the catalog and otherwise cooled her heels in Ohio until Garvin was ready to start buying again. And when he finally was ready, he dove in. In 1934, the esteemed collector Louis Gurino Myers, who had come up with the idea for the Girl Scouts loan exhibition, passed away. His widow sold Garvin one of most of his decanters, including an incredibly rare example in the flute and pine pattern that features the word cherry across its belly, indicating that it was intended to hold cherry brandy. 
1935, the York, Pennsylvania dealer Joe Kindig offered Garvin an imposing tumbler made by John Frederick Emelin's New Bremen Glass Manufactory. The so-called Boston Tumbler was a gift from Amelung to the founders of the Boston Crown Glass Company in 1789 as a show of support for their new venture, as well as, as, well as a symbol of camaraderie between two glass manufacturers. Garvin and Niddle continued to fill gaps in Yale's holdings with unusual pieces, including a pipe that was supposedly made by the gaffer Morris Holmes working at New York's Congressville Glass Works. They also acquired an endearing and unusual whimsy in the form of a turtle, made by taking a flask promoting sailors' rights to which they had been added legs and a tail. In the seven years following Garvin's initial gift, he gave Yale about 5,000 more pieces of furniture, prints, silver, and other decorative arts, including some of its most remarkable glass. As the new objects arrived, Niddle directed them either to Garvin's loft on Madison Avenue, to one of the family homes, or up to Yale or Andover. Her trips to New Haven became increasingly frequent as she dove into cataloging the collection. Her insistence on installing the exhibition cases herself seems to have been met with re resigned bemusement by the staff who referred to her simply as the glass lady. She also served as Garvin's proxy at events he could not attend and passed along praise over his generous gift to the university. When the Collectors League of America honored Garvin at the opening of the New York Antiques Expo Exposition in October 1935, Niddle was unable to attend and wrote a note to Garvin, quote, I had a hard time of it to keep from crying this morning. I want to be there so much for no one in America more fully realize what you have done than I do. God bless you for it. Through these efforts, Niddle and Garvin established a close relationship. Niddle embroidered her letters with anecdotes about family and friends, as well as updates on her health. When the arts writer Charles Messer Stowe ran a series of articles on Garvin and his gift to Yale, Rhea provided unsolicited commentary. To get back to Charlie Stowe, I like him very much. He has ability, although he hops around from one thing to another, and he's not nearly as old as he looks, just three years my senior. But his present wife is, in my estimation, quite impossible. She is number three, and I'm getting to believe that one is quite a bit better off to hold on to and stick tight to the loves of one's youth. The lure and the glamour of the second, the third, or the fourth, soon it seems wears off. Sometimes I wonder where our country is headed to with this mass of divorces. In Ohio, you can obtain one if you don't like the color of the necktie your husband is wearing, or just about as bad as that. Their mutual affection mitigated conflicts over purchases. When Niddle complained about his refusal to buy a group of glass, Garvin encouraged her to keep hunting for, quote, anything absolutely remarkable for the collection. And then he noted, I never intended to buy those pieces. The price is terrible but you are a beautiful and wonderful woman. Rhea retorted, I'll forgive you for writing that I am a beautiful woman, for you know very well that I am anything but that. And I don't think I am wonderful, and neither do you. So I call your letter a dash of blarney and a dish of baloney. Garvin died unexpectedly of pneumonia on November 7th, 1937, at the age of 64. The news shocked his associates. Niddle sent a letter to Garvin's then assistant, Elizabeth Greaves, expressing her sadness. Intermingled with her grief over losing a friend was confusion over her, the fate of her role in the collection. She had not yet completed the manuscript for an anticipated catalog of the glass at Yale, and there were numerous objects sitting in the loft on approval. Greaves replied that, quote, we are still stunned by the suddenness of it all and the loss of the best boss there ever was and the best friend. She informed Niddle that the unpurchased glass would be returned to her. And she said that, quote, if Mrs. Garvin goes along with the good work, perhaps she may be interested, but nothing is settled yet and we are trying to make things as simple as possible here. Francis Garvin was the driving force behind the collection, however, and, when, and with his death, momentum stopped. Niddle's catalog remained unfinished, and the, and the manuscript eventually disappeared. 
Although the collection remained incomplete at the time of Garvin's death, it was visionary in its accessibility and pedagogical potential. In Rhea Mansfield Niddle, he found someone of equal determination who proved a worthy foil. Her own willfulness pushed his acquisitions into new areas and made it representative of a more expansive view of American glass, which mirrored his own ambitions for the role, material, uh, the role of material culture within the educational life of the United States. When Garvin presented his collections to Yale in 1930, the only other educational institution promoting the study of American material culture was St. John's College in Annapolis, where RTH Halsey taught courses that relied heavily on objects supplied by Garvin. In terms of cultural institutions, the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art was only six years old, and many of the gifts that would transform other museums were still on the horizon. Garvin envisioned his collections forming, quote, a great panorama of American arts and crafts, quote, end quote, that would be used to instill a sense of patriotism in students and museum goers, regardless of their backgrounds. As Garvin wrote in his letter committing his collections to Yale, quote, earlier late at the Vineyard Gate, the rich heritage of American citizenship is for all alike. The collections have not remained static since Garvin's death. In the 1940s, the Bakewell family don uh, donated a magnificent cut gla glass vase because of the legacy of Garvin's collections. And the, whole, and the holdings continue to expand into territories that Garvin could not have even imagined, so that the art gallery can exhibit the richness of American craft of all eras. American Glass, the collections at Yale, builds on Garvin's idea of a great panorama and incorporates objects from across the university's campus, including the Peabody Museum of Natural History and the Beinecke Rare Book Library, to take an even wider view of glass as a material that is ever present in American life. Thank you. So this is normally the portion of the evening where we open things up to questions, but we're not going to do that. Um, instead, I invite you all out to the lobby, to the reception and the book signing, where I will be conveniently located at a table where I can take your questions there. So thank you all for coming. And see you soon.